Welcome everyone. We're, we're glad that you can join us here this afternoon for our virtual visit. We're excited to tell you more about the education program at Carthage. My name is Ashley Hansen. I'm the Associate Vice President for Admissions and Financial Aid. While we wish we were able to welcome you all on campus in person, um, we are glad that we have this virtual opportunity available for you. When the campus is able to host visitors, we can't wait to have you then. But today is all about the education program at Carthage. You're going to be hearing from two of our expert faculty members. And then throughout this, as guests, you are welcome to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions. There's both the public chat feature and there's also the question and answer section if you wish to answer something privately. But we will address all of your questions at the end of your presentations. I would like to introduce to you Dr. Karen Sconcert and Dr. Michelle Hancock, wonderful faculty members within our program, and they're so excited to share with you more about the education program at Carthage. So for now, I will turn it over to them. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Hi, th thanks, Ashley. It's, uh, it's great to be here. We're always excited to talk about our programs at Carthage. Um, I am the chair of the education department. That means that um, I interact with the state of Wisconsin around certification issues. I, I help to hire and supervise faculty. Um, and I, I do a lot of troubleshooting for students when it's hard to fit in whatever class they need or they're trying to decide between elementary and secondary ed or all kinds of things like that. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I'm not really sure how to describe it. I don't think there's really an, an equivalent position in other, uh, in other areas of business. But anyway, I'm a department chair. Um, and Dr. Hancock, you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. I am a professor in the Department of Education and also I'm a director, director of the Urban Teacher Prep Program and director of the ACT Program, which is an accelerated certification program for teachers at the graduate level. Right. So today we're talking about our undergraduate programs at Carthage, what it would be like, what your options are in education as an undergraduate as you begin as a freshman you know next year or the year after so um, we have a quick powerpoint to share with you and then we will we'll do some question and answer things so i'm hoping i get this right here comes the screen share now it has good okay <laughs> so there's our cover uh our cover slide just education at carthage um Carthage Education has a couple of different kinds of programs. I'm going to talk about the licensure programs. The first is, oops, I'm going to put it on pause. It's going right ahead. We have elementary education, which is a major, and it's you would get certification grades K through nine if you chose that one. We also allow students to double major in elementary education and cross categorical special education. Your elementary license would be K through nine, but the special ed license it prepares you to be an assisting or, or main special ed teacher in grades K through 12. Oops, trying to push the next one. Okay, the next one is we have um, secondary ed is a minor at Carthage. You would first major in whatever subject area you intend to teach, whether that's history or English or biology or um, whatever it is that you're choosing to major in. And that is a license for grades K through, I, I'm sorry, grades four through nine. Um, you may also choose to major in the subject area and the secondary ed minor along with a cross categorical special education major. So if you if your goal is to teach special ed students at the middle and high school level, that's your best bet, although your license for special ed will be K through 12. We also have art, music, theater, foreign language, and oops, this went too far, sorry. I don't know why it keeps advancing on its own. Mm -hmm. We have art, music, theater, foreign language, and physical education grades K through 12. So all of those programs exist um, here at Carthage. 
Okay, so we also have several unique, oops, it keeps going ahead, <laughs> unique minors for elementary education students. We have a STEM minor, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Education, and Math. We have an urban education minor, which Dr. Hancock is going to tell you a lot more about in a little bit. And we have a license for English language learners um, that you can do as a graduate right now, but we'll have it as available for undergraduates uh, soon. And that's almost a minor, but it comes with its own license. I think one of the great things, I've taught at a few different universities, and I think one of the really great things about, oops, did it again, about uh, being at Carthage and learning to be a teacher at Carthage is the Liberal Arts Foundation. The fact that you will um, be really broadly educated in many different subjects. And so you're not just gonna learn how to teach math, you'll take a math course. You're not just going to learn how to teach reading. You're gonna do a lot of reading and, and dissecting texts and know a lot about what it is you're going to teach. So I think that's a really great thing. Uh, along with that is the content knowledge, as I, as I indicated. So you'll be broadly educated. You'll also be deeply educated in knowledge around teaching and learning. Um, and you will learn specific methods for working with different students. Um, everyone takes a course in special education. Everyone gets some basic instruction in working with English language learners. And everyone has, is required to take an entire class um, for diversity. Um, and, the, and you have a choice of courses around that. We also have extensive field experiences for all levels. We start you out um, in freshman year with some observations in every program. As you move into your sophomore year, you'll get chances to do more work, maybe tutoring, teaching a few lessons. As you enter the teacher education program, which most people do at the middle or end of their sophomore year, you have to apply for it. Once you're there, you'll do some more extensive field experiences um, and teaching a lot of lessons. If you're in elementary education, you'll spend a couple of days a week in a, in a school. And uh, Dr. Hancock will tell you more about how if you chose urban ed, you would do so much more extensive field experiences. Uh, we also have lots of other opportunities on campus and there it went in advanced again, sorry. I don't know why it keeps <laughs> doing that. Um, so uh, all students at Carthage have a chance um, to apply to do summer research or to do research courses during the school year. So this poster is from Celebration of Scholars, which we do every year, usually in April. Um, I believe this year it's going to be virtual, so I'm sure you can actually see it yourselves because uh, you won't have to be on campus to see it. Uh, but as you can see, these are students who did original research on development of student reading interests, and they presented it at this um, very large celebration of scholars that we have each year. The clinical experiences that we have are pretty impressive. So again, I told you I've taught at a multi, uh, several different universities, and the one thing that I really, really love about teaching at Carthage is that we are truly immersed in the local schools and the local schools are very welcoming of our students. We are not really competing. There are only two teacher ed programs and they welcome all of us into the schools from the both of the colleges in the area. Uh, we have lots and lots of different schools that we place our students in a wide variety of settings. Um, I work primarily with secondary students and there are so many different high school programs in this um, area that students can become acquainted with. And I think one of the things that's very important about our setting is that we are located in Kenosha, but we're almost in Racine. We're in two of the five largest cities and school districts in the state. So there's a lot going on here, a lot of opportunity to do service, a lot of opportunity to truly be immersed and the opportunity to learn to work with diverse populations. I think that's really important. And part of what we have to offer you that we think is really unique is the Urban Teacher uh, Prep Program, which I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Hancock to tell you a little bit more about. Okay, are you gonna scroll for me too? I am gonna scroll for you. I hope it won't like run ahead the way it just did <laughs> for me. Okay, so welcome everyone. I'd like to tell you more about the Preparing Future Teachers for Success in Urban Schools. Three years ago in 2017, Carthage College was awarded 
$150,000 grant to implement the Urban Teacher Preparation Program. And it's in partnership with Racine Unified School District. You can change. Our purpose was to identify, instruct, and inspire, and increase the number of highly effective, resilient teachers committed to teaching in high needs urban school settings. And that's basically to close the opportunity and achievement gaps. Now, the unique features of the urban teacher prep program is this. Um, first of all, you can have, um, you can have a, a minor in urban education, excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied there. You can have a minor in urban education. Uh, we are a cohort based program. We accept only to about 12 to 20 students per year. Uh, we have a four-year clinical co-teaching model. Now, this is critically important. During your freshman year, there are so many hours that you are going to have to obtain each and every semester in the schools. You are assigned to an expert urban educator in the Racine City School District, and we ask you your preference for grade level, and you are placed in a school, and you're in, basically in that school for three to four years. You do have an opportunity to go to other schools and experience other educators and how they teach. But the beauty of the four-year clinical co-teaching model is that you are literally uh, in the schools, in a particular school for four years, getting to know the community, getting to know the students, embracing the parents, and getting to know the administration and the other teachers in the building. Also, Racine uh, Unified pay our teacher candidates every summer to teach summer school. They assist the summer school teachers and they co-teach with them. They absolutely have even led some of the summer after school activities, our teacher candidates. This is a wonderful opportunity to be in the schools almost year round. And then um, what we haven't implemented yet, but we plan to implement this coming year is STEAM certification. And STEAM is, I'm sure people know, this is science, technology, you know, uh, math, art, English language arts. It's an integration of all those different content areas. And we want our teacher candidates to become certified with STEAM certification. Also, another requirement is that we have community service requirements, and that's embedded in all the coursework when you are accepted into the TEP, the teacher education program. We connect the, the community service with our courses that we teach. Okay, the next slide. Now, here are some of the courses that are offered in the urban education minor. Engaging diverse students and families. English language learners, methods and instruct and studies in education. Culturally responsive instruction. Foundations in urban education. Urban and cultural leadership. And teachers and teaching in urban education. So you earn 24 credit hours in this minor and all of these courses are connected to your field experiences for the most part. And now what I'd like to have uh, one of our students who she is in the program, Molly, and she will share her perspective with you about being in the urban teacher preparation program. My name is Molly McCaw, and I'm finishing up my junior year. Can you see it? Uh, she's blocked to the side for some reason. Okay, okay let me stop. Education Let me try again. The minor in urban education there, we'll do that. the Urban Teacher Preparation Program. Today, I'll be speaking with you about the likes of the program, the main benefits of it, how to balance school, and also the career benefits. So what makes this program so great? What I think makes this program so great is the experience I've gained through it. Not only have I gained experience inside of the classroom with my mentor teacher, but I've also had opportunities outside of the classroom. The one main thing that I've gained through it is the summer school experience through Racine Unified. 
That was such a fun and exciting experience, and I'm so sad that I won't be able to do it this year. Another thing this program has given me is so much more confidence with teaching in the classroom. Not only has it given me confidence in the classroom, but it's also given me confidence to speak in my courses. Let's talk about the main benefits of the program. The main benefits of it is the relationships that you build in the school. Not only have I built a relationship with my mentor teacher, but I've also built relationships with other teachers, the administration, staff members, and also my favorite is the students. The next thing I want to talk about is how we balance everything in college. In order to balance everything, you have to have proper time management. So you have to prioritize what is important to you. And if this program seems important to you, you will do everything that you can to finish your schoolwork, to get to the school on time, and to continuously work hard in your classes. So let's talk about the career benefits of this program. The main career benefit of this program is the experience you've gained through it, not only for teaching, but for life. So you are able to go into an interview and talk about this program and how much you have put into this program from freshman year all the way to senior year. Another main benefits that I feel is important is the connections that you make through it. So you make connections with administration, you make connections with other teachers, and this program will benefit you in the long run. I hope you all are staying safe and healthy. Bye. Thank you. That, that was really, that was one of our students who really wanted to share her experiences with you. And I just want to share a few takeaways from what Molly has shared with you so far. Uh, our urban teacher candidates, they have a profound belief that the students will one day be agents of change. They see themselves as servants of the community. These students really see themselves as servants of the community. They believe that they view teaching in an urban school as a way of life. They understand that. And it's not just what they do. Uh, they're not afraid of the community that they teach in. And therefore, they're building meaningful relationships with students and their families. They also are highly effective in their lesson planning and how to constantly adapt and change those working documents. They go back and think and reflect and improve upon what they have designed because they are learning from the children as much as they are teaching the children. They are constantly searching for resources, these teacher candidates, and they wanna bring those resources into the classroom. And finally, they teach their students that they should have righteous indignation, and they see it as a strength and not as a punishment. We've had a number of students, three or four, who are now out there searching for employment. And the feedback from the principals in the different um, districts where they have been, they, where they have interviewed, have uh, responded by sharing how effective these young adults are in their delivery and in their interviews, and how they view themselves as educators who can teach any and all students. So thank you for participating in this webinar. Yeah. I just want to emphasize again that so the urban teacher prep program is it requires a big commitment from students, but the rewards are huge and uh, and and they've done so many great things that we've adopted some of the practices that they were doing in urban teacher prep so that our regular elementary ed students get some of the same kinds of experiences. They have more of an immersion in the junior year than they used to because we've seen the benefits of that for the students who are uh, not in the urban teacher prep program. So um, it's really been very impressive. I'm gonna do this. Oops. Hi everyone, my name is Nala uh -oh. McCaw and She's I'm finishing up my- Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me get back to where we were. <laughs> Thank you, Karen and Michelle, that was great. And so for students um, and families, please make sure they use the chat feature there at the bottom of the screen if you have any questions. We already have some questions popping through. So sure. one student asked, 
you know, what if I'm undecided on the grade level that I want to teach? You know, how do you guys help with me figuring out if I wanted to do elementary or if I wanted to do the, the, the high, high school level? Well, the, you're, that's a great question and I, we have a really good answer for that. So the first, uh, before you apply for the teacher education program, everyone takes a set of three courses. And the first two courses, the first one is called Education and Society, and the second is Educational Psychology. Everyone takes those regardless of what grade level they intend to go into. And part of the process in those courses is doing some field work, some observations and some mm -hmm. research in local schools. So uh, that would be something you would want to let your professor know that you're, you're trying to make a decision and uh, they could help place you in schools that might help you make that decision uh, where you could ask questions of the teachers and do some observation and really kind of feel right in your heart, you know, does this feel right to me? Do I really want to hang out with teenagers all the time or do I really love first grade? Um, a lot of people come in thinking one thing and then change their mind. So one of, one of the interesting things is both elementary and secondary uh, certification overlap with middle school. And almost no one comes in and says, hey, I want to be a middle school teacher. But you would not be, it is amazing how many people, once they get in the middle school, decide that's really what they want. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you can do that from either certification. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, one student, Veronica, asked, with the urban education minor being such a big commitment, is it realistic to still have a job outside of that as well? Yes, as a matter of fact, the majority of my teacher candidates, they, they work all four years while they're in, uh, in undergraduate. That has not been a problem at all. Right, and I, I would say a, a huge majority of students on campus in general, but certainly in education do have jobs. One of the nice things is that we are constantly asked for tutors, for childcare, uh, for mm -hmm. after school programs, for before school programs. People contact us all the time looking for students who mm -hmm. might wanna work in those positions. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's obviously good experience for you as a future teacher. So if, uh, if you need to work, um, you would not be alone, lots of people do. Yes, and a lot of my teacher candidates that's in the urban pro portion of the program, they work in restaurants. And so that allows them a lot of flexible hours. And so that's another something that you can think about if you are working in a restaurant, it does not impede your ability to, to be part of the program and work in restaurants as well. Mm -hmm. Great, oh, we have some great questions coming in. So Miles has asked, I want to be the best teacher I can be. And it seems like the urban teacher edu pro education program can accommodate that. Although I want to teach history at the high school level, would I still be able to take a history minor to teach it? Uh, so unfortunately, um, <laughs> this prep program only works with the K through nine license. So if you want to be a history teacher at the high school level, you need to do a secondary uh, minor. And the issue is that you need a major in the subject area. So uh, you don't actually have a lot of time to do the rest of this. Now that doesn't mean you can't take a lot of the courses in the mm -hmm. Urban Teacher Prep Program. And we can definitely place you in an urban high school. No problem with that. We've got exactly. plenty of places. So, uh, so you, will, uh, you can interact with Dr. Hancock and the program a lot uh, mm -hmm. by taking several of the courses, even if you don't earn the full minor. And again, if you make that, that known that that's your intention, we will be very intentional about your placements for when you go into the schools. Great. One student wants to know about teaching the languages. She wants to become a German teacher and how would study abroad affect her experience or her courses? So uh, the, the language uh, teaching certification is actually K through 12, but as you probably know, most people end up teaching middle or high school. And so, uh, so we have our students do the, most of the secondary minor to get the certification. Although the class that you take that's specifically about teaching languages teach, tells you how to do it for K through 12. So you would major in German. 
Uh, and we just, when we know that, we just plan around your study abroad. It's really not a problem at all. We have probably three to five people do a language major every year. The trickier thing about German is you have to realize that there aren't a lot of schools who teach German anymore. So you have to recognize that that's going to be a little harder to find uh, placements for you to do language study. Um, it, I mean, for, for you to watch language teachers and observe and teach lessons. And it's also going to be harder to find a position. So uh, keep that in mind. I mean, the, obviously the popular language is Spanish, but we also have, uh, uh, we also offer French and there's a surprisingly large need for French. Uh, unfortunately, because I think German is a lovely language, there's just not that many places that teach it. There are schools in Milwaukee. Um, before I came to Carthage, I taught in Pennsylvania. There were a lot of schools that still taught German in Pennsylvania. I know there are a lot in Ohio as well. So I don't know if you have a particular place you're aiming for, but that's just something to keep in mind. Wonderful. So um, kind of a twofold question. Mm -hmm. How soon do I get in the classroom to get observation hours? And when do I take my first education course? Most people take their first education course in the freshman year of the year. And, mm -hmm. we, and we have uh, observation hours in that very first class. And then Karen, how many observation hours will they graduate with? Well, it depends on the program. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it, once you get past your sophomore year, it's usually not just observation. And if you're an urban teacher prep, it's not. Right. right. So, <laughs> you know, the first year, most students are doing only observation. The second year, you're probably starting to teach some lessons here and there. Um, and then, you know, as each year goes on, there's more lessons in the classroom. We have lots of teachers that we work with to, that'll let you teach in their classroom. Mm -hmm. For the elementary ed program, we have a junior block program where all of the juniors that aren't in the urban teacher prep program all go to the same elementary mm -hmm. school in the fall on Tuesdays mm -hmm. and Thursdays to teach lessons and help and do recess duty and mm -hmm. do parent teacher conferences and every other thing that you would do if you were a teacher there. And in mm -hmm. the spring, they go to a middle school on Tuesdays and Thursdays, whereas mm -hmm. the urban teacher prep students, they're doing all that stuff right from the freshman year. Anytime that right. they're assigned hours in their classes, they go to their mm -hmm. urban teacher prep Mm -hmm. program placement. Wow, that was a lot of peas. And they, <laughs> they, do, they do their work there. So they, they get a lot more hours than, than the rest of the students. Mm -hmm. um, I would, you know, it ranges from urban teacher prep has the, most uh -oh. secondary ed has the least simply because they are earning a money major. Um, everyone does a, a whole semester of student teaching. It's 18 weeks. So those days you'll be in school all the time, but we try to set it up so that you're doing quite a bit of work in the classroom the semester before you student teach so that you're really ready for that. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, we tried to add it up recently. What did you come up with for urban teacher prep? Yes, for urban teacher prep for the four years is, is 1,016 hours. And we break it out by each year. Your freshman year is 84 hours out in the schools and it, gro and it grows each year. It's a progressive, progressive continuum that you're working from, which is a clinical supervision model that is implemented within the urban teacher prep program. And one of the strengths of the program that the teacher candidates always tell us is that by, time they, by the time they have hit their junior year and they're taking their methods classes, they feel so much more confident and knowledgeable and understanding what professors are teaching about the nitty gritty of educating students and working with children. And they are learning more about their content when you're junior year, you're learning more about reading, math, science, you're taking social studies, the content areas, but our students are coming into the courses, having a high level of confidence about how to engage and manage a classroom. Mm -hmm. So uh, the students who are not in urban teacher prep have a, maybe about half that number of hours because that first year, typically they take either two or three education courses and they usually require 10 to 15 hours per course. Mm -hmm. And then their sophomore year, they're usually taking two or three more. 
So it's not really until junior year that they get a lot of, of field hours, whereas in the urban teacher prep program, they do a lot of field hours from the very first year. Great. Mm -hmm. So if a student is from Illinois or wants to teach outside of Wisconsin, how does licensing work? Well, you're in luck. So um, <laughs> Wisconsin ha has a pretty um, strict licensing requirements. So uh, it's actually very easy to get licensed in another state. Um, obviously, Illinois is the most common one, but we have students in recent years who have, have been from or chosen to go to Iowa, Minnesota, was, was Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Florida, Colorado, and California, and probably other states I'm not thinking of. So the first thing you do is you will fill out your paperwork for your Wisconsin license. And then um, during your student teaching seminar, which is on Monday nights during the time when you're student teaching, there, there's a night where they fill out all the paperwork for Wisconsin. Uh, and then those people who wanna fill out another license Mm -hmm. Just hang around and get in help filling out the next version of the license. You get your Wisconsin license first, and then each state is slightly different in what they ask you to do. At the moment, Illinois is like, sure, you got a Wisconsin license, we'll take you, and you fill out the paperwork and you can get the license. You know, it, it may change, you never know from year to year, but I'd say for like the last five years or so, it's just kind of automatic for Illinois. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the factors that the department is looking for, for being accepted into the program? Mm -hmm. oh, good point. That's an excellent question. Do you want to try it? Uh, well, well, number one, uh, I think the major thing is having an open mind. You know, you want to be open-minded. You want to be a person who is adaptable and flexible. You also, uh, I feel that you have to be a person that wants to, that enjoy being around children, mm -hmm. you know? Also, I think you have to have a certain level of confidence in your ability to speak and to have a voice and develop that voice because part of being a teacher, a major part of being a teacher is developing presence in the classroom that we help you to do that. Yeah. But it has to be a strong desire, I feel, within young people who mm -hmm. say they want to become educators, that there's a sense of joy about you, that you have a positive attitude about life, about what you want to achieve in life. And yes, you might be young, but I have the students that have enrolled in the program. We've had students in their freshman year that have gone into the urban teacher prep or gone into elementary education and said, well, let me rethink this this is not really for me because they've had some exposure out in the schools and they decided, no, this is not what I want to do. And that's really a-okay. What we want, mm -hmm. I feel from Cartridge, when you enter our the Department of Education, we want you to have a strong desire to, to explore the option of what it means to become an educator. It's such a, a rewarding profession. And so that's what I feel that we're looking for. Karen? So I would agree. And I also think um, what the thing that you said about liking children. So, so one of the things that I work with the, the secondary ed students most of the time, and sometimes I have people who are like, I just love English. I love reading books. I love writing. Can't wait to do more of that. And then I said, but do you love teenagers? Because the job is actually working with teenagers. It's not working with books. So that is one of the things that we try to make sure. You, you really have to have a love of children at whatever level you're choosing. Okay. Um, there are some, some requirements around GPA and proving your basic skills, reading, writing, and math. Um, those are all things that we can you know, discuss in depth, but it's, it, that's pretty standard. Any education program that you go into is going to have those kinds of requirements. Mm -hmm. And then once you're in the program, like uh, before you student teach, we do an interview with, uh, we, we invite local teachers and principals in to do interviews with everyone to give you a chance to express why you want to be a teacher. And that's part of the requirement for getting into student teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there are a lot of, um, I guess I would say boxes to check, but the, I think I'm really glad, Michelle, that you started by saying it's about loving children and about 
finding your voice and being open-minded because really those are sort of the key things. If you don't have those, there's, you know, it doesn't matter what grades you have. Mm -hmm. um, one student has asked, will I graduate within four years as an education major? Uh, I would say probably 95% of the people do every yes, now and then. Someone will want to do something interesting like maybe a study abroad when they're not a language major or something like that. And that might mean that they would student teach the semester after graduation instead of in the four years. But we've really set it up so that if you are able to meet, you know, the GPA goals and the rest of those things that you should uh, be able to finish in four years, even with the double major in special ed, everyone, not everyone, but really most people do finish in four years. Mm -hmm. And urban ed is set up that way because it's a cohort. So. Right. Yeah. So, Michelle, this question is for you. Veronica is asking, if I wanted to get into the urban education program, where do I start? Well, you start by sending an email to Dr. Michelle Hancock, mhancock1 at cartridge.edu, to let us know that you're interested. I, we have Savan uh, Williams, an instructor as part-time that works at Carthage and we do an interview with you. We sit you down and have a discussion about why you think you want to be an urban educator. So that's where you start by reaching out to myself or instructor Williams. Yep. And you know I would like to mention something else. I see on in the chat someone also asked about could I still study abroad with an education major and yeah. I would yeah and so I want to share with you if you go to the Carthage study abroad page you will see our J term which is our January trip uh, one of the things that the Department of Education has really supported me and we work together on is that we've adopted a school in South Africa and it, it was an outgrowth of the students who had gone there in 2017, 2018, and we visited South Africa, and it was, we went to Cape Town, Johannesburg, Durban, we went a lot of different places, and we visited schools, and we looked at museums, and we did all the things you do for j -term to learn about South Africa and the communities within these different cities and rural areas. Well, the students decided to adopt uh, Nakumi Primary School, which is a K through grade eight school building in Ashawi, South Africa. And from that, students also created uh, the Future of Africa Student Org. And these students fundraise, and we actually do projects over in Ishawi with that school to help support them. And it's not about, we don't focus it on charity. It's all about sustainability and change. And so, and a number of students who have majored in education in the Department of Education, about three or four of them have traveled with myself and other professors to go to South Africa and work and support that school. And so I just want you to know that, um, Study abroad is one of the most phenomenal things that Carthage has. Mm -hmm. And I, as an instructor, a professor, I feel extremely grateful that I have the opportunity to work with my colleagues in the Department of Education, to work with students who are so passionate about global citizenship and about um, sustainability, how you help underserved communities, not just here in the States, but also in the world. So I just want you to know, I'm really putting a big plug in about study abroad because I, I just found it to be a phenomenal feature. And if you go, like I said, to the website, you will see where we're scheduled. We don't know what the COVID-19, what the outcome would be. We had to cancel our trip in June. We were going in June, about 12 students and myself were heading back to South Africa to do work at Nakumi Primary School. We hope to go in January. If not, we'll push back. And we offer scholarships for students so they can have access to go on some of these trips. Right. And so there is the short term study abroad, like J term in January or in June. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we had one of our faculty members peer, paired up with a, a professor in the languages and they went to China the summer before this and uh, spent a lot of time preparing by studying Chinese language. Exactly. Um, but then there's also like the semester study abroad, which is typically done by language majors, but not limited to language majors. So mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of opportunities to study abroad. And if you know from the beginning that you want to do both, we will figure out a way to make it all fit. Right. One question that we received in a private message is, how are you engaging with your students during remote learning? Mm. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> Um, so I, I actually teach the course called Foundations in Urban Education, and um, I love that course, and I'm so proud of all the, the things that we've done over the years, and one of the saddest things for me was when this whole remote learning started, because uh, a big part of the course in the second half is students um, uh, work with one of the one of the uh, urban educators that are identified by their principals as being master teachers. We call them dream keepers based on a mm -hmm. book uh, that's sort of a classic in the field of urban education. And they spend about eight to 10 hours in the classroom observing that teacher and then interviewing them and writing a dream keeper profile of the teacher. And only about mm -hmm. four students out of 25 had done that before all this happened. Mm -hmm. and then the second part of it was that they would go into the school and uh, with the help of the teachers and principals identify a need write a plan to do a service project that would help to fulfill that need and then work with whichever people in the building you have their students or teachers or whatever to to um, fulfill a need and pr perform a service and so they really didn't get to do those things mm -hmm. and it really made me sad but one thing that we are doing which is very thrilling is that we're reading a book um, called ghosts in the schoolyard by eve ewing she's a professor in the school of social service administration at the university of chicago she also writes um for marvel comics uh, a, a thing called um is it Braveheart? I think that's the name of her, her character. And she is also a poet. Anyway, she wrote this fantastic book about uh, school closings in the city of Chicago, including a school that she had worked at when she was a teacher. And Dr. Ewing has agreed to do a Zoom call with my class. I, try, I, I called her up and I said, please, is there any chance you could do this because um Outstanding. yeah because because they're you know they're missing out on some of these other things so mm -hmm. um so i'm pretty excited for them that's going to happen in about 10 days and mm -hmm. so we're getting ready for being really prepared sharing our projects that they did for the classes mm -hmm. so that's how that's happening with one of my other classes i've had some alumni help out by um because my students can do the lessons and the observations they would normally do. I've had some alumni who live in all over the place. One of them is in Florida. One is in Wisconsin Dells and they're, they're having zoom calls with my students so that they can ask questions about what was it like when you were a new teacher and what's your best tip for classroom management and that sort of thing. So, so it's kind of, there've been some interesting new opportunities. Um, I don't, I, I have to say that the, it is very hard to do this without, without having actual time in the classroom. I don't, what, are you, what have you been doing, Dr. Hancock? Yeah, well, for me, I, I was used to online because when I was school superintendent, I actually started an online leadership program with uh, men, administrators in the school district. So when we had to a switch to remote, I, my syllabuses were set and I just had to do minor adaptations that really engage. My courses run three hours. Like I like, I like evening teaching. So, so my course like culturally responsive instruction is from six to nine on a Wednesday night. We stuck with our time frame, and we, I use Zoom and we use breakout rooms and my activities were highly creative because I have over 40 years in schools and 25 or more of those years were in the classroom k-12 so all i had to do was adapt some of my activities but i teach the way i was teach like i was in the classroom and so uh, the feedback so far that i have gotten from the courses that i teach um, the students have really commended the activities they feel that they're on point they're learning 
And uh, I think that's all you can ask. I just received an email from a student who uh, gave me accolades and I was really humbled by this. He actually sent me a long email today thanking me for the way in which I instructed in the course and the way they learned. And I try to keep the innovation and creativity. I miss being in the classroom with the students. I'm like Dr. Scossard, I genuinely miss that. But I also know that opportunity when adversity strikes, and if you look at it as adversity, you can always you can always come back and turn you know turn it into lemonade. You can make lemons out of lemonade, and that's what I believe many of the instructors at Carthage have done. And I have just enjoyed engaging with my students via Zoom. I don't. I will hope that we can come back and be in the classroom. That's the number one thing because I do like the face to face. But I also have seen where my students have stayed connected and I also am the advisor of the Future, Future of Africa student org and we meet uh, every two weeks. So I'm staying connected to all my students and they're staying connected to each other. And I think that's what's really critically important about the remote learning. Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. One question we had from Claire, would it work out for me to minor in a language in addition to majoring in education? Yes. So if you're interested in K through nine teaching, this is a very common choice for a minor is to minor in Spanish or some other language. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't, you won't have certification to teach Spanish, although maybe if you're fluent enough later on, you could um, learn to do bilingual education and add that license on. Uh, but for for most people, what's really helpful about having language is that it makes you a better teacher of English in general because you've had the experience of learning a language yourself. Also, if you do happen to learn a language that's commonly spoken in the in the school that you're in, um, principals love it when you can speak Spanish or French to their parents, you know, and, and, or whatever the language choice is for you. So yes, a lot of people do minor in a language along with elementary ed. That's pretty common. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Sconser and Dr. Hancock. This has been amazing information this evening for our students. You know, please do feel free to ask any last questions. Um, this webinar will be available over the weekend on our website so if you care to share it with family members or friends and then also both of our wonderful faculty members here are available by email which we will share on the document on our web as well but we thank you all for attending here this afternoon yep thank you yeah thank you so much nice to not see you but <laughs> I'm sure we'll be in touch, right exactly <laughs>